said we're getting close to the end of that study of the parables of Christ and I just hope you had an opportunity or if you haven't is study this I mean this is an awesome awesome um, book and that's the Christ's object lessons I've I've been thoroughly personally thoroughly enjoying the study Um, but today we're going to be taking coming from chapter 26 and the title of that particular chapter is is friends by the mammon of unrighteousness. Now, when I first saw that title, I was like, Lord, what do you mean? Because I have, I mean, I've read it before, but I was, the thing that kind of caught me up was the mammon of unrighteousness, friends by mammon of unrighteousness. So we're going to be learning what that all means as we go forward. But today, we're going to be talking about not only mammon of un- unrighteousness, that we're going to talk, talk about in the last half of the sermon today, we're going to be talking about walls. I know there's a lot of talk about walls. Is there a lot of talk about walls in the news today? <laughs> We've heard a lot about a wall. They want to build this, this wall several miles between Mexico and United States. And, of course, we know who's pushing that. Trump's pushing it. And he, and he says the people that don't want the wall, he said, you're paying for it. Now, Mexico don't want a wall, but you're saying you're paying for it. And then the president of Mexico said, and then I think, I don't know who, who said it. Uh, you know, I don't know if it was Trump or the, Mexi- the Mexican president. They ain't coming. I think Trump said, if you ain't paying for it, dust don't even come. <laughs> but anyways, a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about walls. But we're going to talk about walls. We ain't talking about the Mexican wall today. Just, you know, I'm going to leave that alone. But we're going to talk about walls because they're talking about building a wall. But at the same time, there's someone tearing down walls. The question is, should we be building a wall or tearing it down? <laughs> we're going to find out some stuff today. And like I said, we're not talking about Mexican wall. But walls, today's sermon title is Walls and the Mammon of Unrighteousness. Let's look at that in today's lesson. Walls and the Mammon of Unrighteousness. Now, what did God instruct Moses to build in the wilderness as, the, as a teaching tool for his plan of salvation. Everybody should know that. What did he tell him to build? A sanctuary. And what did he say? What was the text? We find it, in a, uh, we find it here in Exodus 25, 8. He said what? Let them build me a what? Sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, sanctuary in its connotation is a place of refuge. Amen. Happy Sabbath. It's a, it's, a, it's a place of safety, right? It's a place where, just like they have today, they have what they call bird sanctuaries. They have that in, in this county, actually, bird sanctuaries. I know throughout the state, bird sanctuaries. What does it mean by, you ever drive on the highway, or, or especially in the country, you saw a little green sign in North Carolina that said bird sanctuary? You ever know what that meant? Bird sanctuary. What does that mean? Right, you can't kill the birds. It's a bird. You can't go hunting. You can't hunt in that area for birds. You can't shoot the birds. It's a place of protection. So, but God says, make me a sanctuary, not only just a place of protection, but a place where I want to live with you, a place where I want to dwell with you. All right? But I want you to, uh, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to talk about the sanctuary a little bit and equate it to walls because it's very important, everybody. So let's, let's understand this. Because Satan has a counterfeit out there, and a lot of people are falling for this. And we have to, we got to be wise in these last days. Now, this earthly sanctuary, of course, we know is a miniature model of the heavenly sanctuary. Because it was a literal heavenly sanctuary. But that miniature sanctuary was a teaching tool 
Like any good teacher, they actually have illustrations. And God says, I'm not going to just talk about an illustration. I'm going to build an illustration of salvation to teach you what it's all about, to teach you about the prophecies of the Messiah. Because that's what it's all about. It taught them about the Mes- what Jesus, what the Messiah was to do on this earth. His whole ministry was to save us from sin. That was a whole model of the sanctuary to teach us how to have victory over sin. So let's look at this in Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. Go to Hebrews chapter 9. Again, we're studying. And uh, this, is, this is good. Hebrews chapter 9. Then we're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Then we're going to look at 11, 12, and 22 through 24. So we're going to skip around just a little bit so we can learn. So in Hebrews, it actually talks about that physical sanctuary pointing to the heavenly sanctuary. And let's go ahead and look at that. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine services, a worldly sanctuary, meaning a earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was candlestick, the table, the showbread, and which was called, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had a golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot and had manna, Aaron rod, budded, and the tables of, cov- of the covenant. And that tables of covenant was a what? Ten commandments, right? So we know what's in that Ark. That Ark of the Covenant was the Aaron's rod, budded, the pot of manna, and Ten Commandments. Y'all know that. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot speak particularly. So in other words, they weren't going to go into particulars about it at that particular time because everybody knew the, the, all the furnishings that's actually in the sanctuary. And everyone here, for the most part, you all know the furnishing that's in the sanctuary and, and have an idea what each one represents. But over, now when the things were, verse 6, and now these things were ordained, the priests went, also, priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. What was he doing that on a daily service? He was, remember, he made the sacrifice in, at the altar, right? They brought the lamb. He had the blood, and he took it into the first compartment, the daily service, right? Went into the holy place, and he either sprinkled it before the veil, or he actually symbolically took the meat and he ate it. Likely transferring the sin from the individual to the holy place. It continues. It happened every single day. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. What is that name? What's that known as? The Day of Atonement. Right. Not without blood, he offered himself and for the heirs of the people. Verse 11. So now he's revealing what this was all about. Verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, but a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So we're not talking about here in verse 11. It's not talking about the physical building on this earth. It's talking about the, the actual building that's up in heaven. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by the, his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having attained eternal redemption for us. Where did Jesus go after he died on the cross and was resurrected? Where did he go? The ho- Is that important? That's extremely important. He went into the holy place. And then we know he went from there to the most holy place. We know that in 1844. There was a prophecy given in Daniel 8.14. And it gave us details in Daniel chapter 9. Now, continue on, verse 22. And almost all things were by the law purged with what? Blood. And without the shedding, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in heaven should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves were better sacrificed than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place with hands, which are figures. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the what? Figures of the true, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So it's clear that, that this earthly sanctuary here pointed to the heavenly sanctuary in heaven. 
in which Jesus Christ is the what? The high priest interceding on our behalf. But again, the sanctuary teaches us the lessons of victory over what, everybody? Sin. That's the whole point. You all remember this. We studied it before. You know, when you, how many gates are in the sanctuary? How many gates? How many gates we got going into the sanctuary? One. What's that represent? Jesus, right? And where in the the Bible does it give us the ministry of Jesus in detail? Where's, where in the Bible does it give us the ministry of Jesus when he was actually here on this earth? The Gospels. How many are there? Remember, there's four pillars. <laughs> Taught us all about Jesus Christ. Because this whole sanctuary teaches us about the ministry of Christ. What color were the, were the um, what color was the gate? What? White, yes, that was part of it. What else? Red, blue, and purple what's the red represent the blood jesus died for our sins what's the blue represent the law of god the standard what does the purple represent royalty so we know when we receive the blood and we keep the commandments red and blue make what all right (laughs) red and blue makes what purple royalty when you're covered by the blood you become royal but you keep the commandments of God. But we know when we're out here in the, in the, out here, when we're out here, we're what? Guilty. But we're coming to here, we're learning how to go from guilty to not guilty. Remember, that is justification. Justification means to go from guilty, you are deserved death, to not guilty. But when you first walk into the justification zone, The justification experience, what's the first thing that you hit? The first item uh, that's found in the sanctuary, once you walk into the sanctuary experience and you want to have total victory over sin, you see what? The altar of what? Burnt offering, or also known as the altar of sacrifice. And what happens there? There you go. You got it. it, There's an exchange going on. Yes, you got to sacrifice, but you got to exchange and how's that happen remember you bring your sacrifice like the lamb but who has to kill the lamb the priest you do because it's your sins what did the lamb do the lamb hurt bite somebody the lamb didn't do anything innocent so god was teaching a lesson what the seriousness of sin then that was god's creatures and i'm sure he didn't want there's little innocent creatures to be killed, but the humans, he came to save who? Human beings. And they were, animals had to be sacrificed, but it's pointing to Jesus. But what did they have to do before they actually killed that lamb? What did they, they had to confess their sins and put their head on the lamb, right? Symbolically transferring their sin to the lamb. All right, we got that. But anyway, we know the rest. There's the, the lamb is sacrificed. We already know these, all these things here, the cross represents Christ the cross where we have to give up sin and God gives us an eternal eternal life but life is not over the labor representing what the baptism right the cleansing but then they go into the holy place into the actual tabernacle itself and at the tabernacle how many pillars are at the tabernacle how many pillars are there five pillars Isaiah 9 6 his name should be called his wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Because that's what you learn about when you go into the sanctuary. <laughs> you learn about the character of God. I'm just going to give you an overview. You, just, you learn about the character of God when you go into the sanctuary. Because inside the sanctuary, what color is the place? It's all is gold. Well, yeah, I'm talking, yeah, that's the color of the, the veil is red, purple, scarlet, just like the color of the, of the gate. But when you go into it, it's made of what? It's a golden room. Everything's gold. All the furniture and the walls are gold. But what gives it light? Is it a candlestick or candlesticks? Is it candlesticks? Who says Sticks. Who says stick? <laughs> is a can- In other words, the only thing I'm trying to say is just one. 
or branches. Remember, it's technically a candlestick or a lampstand with branches. Because who is the middle? Jesus. He says, if you abide in me, I abide in you. So Jesus is a light. We also be the light if we are abiding in Christ. That's the whole, and it's showing that we are the light of the world. Who does the oil represent inside that candlestick? The Holy Spirit. But we, we notice there's a table of showbread, right? That table of showbread has how many, how many pieces of bread? How many? That's right, 12. 12. 12. Representing who? What does it represent? We know it represents the bread, the bread of life. We know that. But, but in general, who does it represent? The 12 tribes. The 12 who else? The 12 apostles. And who else? The 144,000, the multiples of 12. Remember, it all representing that God's disciples, the whole purpose was to do what? To spread the gospel, to spread the good news, to spread the, the, the word of salvation. That was the whole point. It was the point of Israel. A, that's the whole purpose of the disciples, and it's our point today. We are the last day disciples, and as disciples, it's not just in the one region, but we're worldwide, all around the world. All right, then we saw that what else is in there? The altar incense, that's right between the veil, and we know about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, what went around the entire sanctuary? The, the what? The white linen, right. It was a wall. Okay, I want you all to miss this now. Because the thing is, you ask yourself, why did God have a wall around the sanctuary? See, the reality is, does God need walls? God don't need walls. I'm going to give you a clue. I'm going to talk about it at the very end. But don't you notice when you read the description of heaven, there's actually a wall? My Lord, why you got a wall? Because <laughs> there's no enemies. <laughs> You'll find some. What went around that one time? I said, you're right. It's a linen. It was a, it was a wall of fine twine linen. And when you look at the original Hebrew, it was a bleached white. It, was, it, was, it had no spots on it. They had to keep it clean. It was spotless. It was about seven and a half feet tall. But it was just an, tall enough, but just enough, low enough, if you're further away from it, you still see the peak of the actual temple itself. So the, and it's described here in Exodus 27, 18. We won't read that right now, but it's fine twine linen, bleached white. But what's that, all, what's that all mean? What was the meaning of the purpose of the wall of fine twine linen, bleached white, surrounding the sanctuary? What's that all mean? Revelation 19, 18. We read this before last a couple of weeks. I believe a couple of weeks ago, but I want you to see this again. And her was granted that she should be arrayed in what? Fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is what? The righteousness of saints. Now, we know the righteousness of saints receive their righteousness from who? Jesus Christ. We already know that. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So it's all about righteousness with no sin. We I mean, notice it's clean white. White equals what? Righteousness. Who is our righteousness? Jesus is righteousness. He is our righteousness. Now, what is the standard of righteousness in which we are judged by? Everybody should know that. What is it? The what? The law. Y'all got it. The law. It's very important that y'all, I know y'all know this part. But the Bible says here in Psalms 119, 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. This is important to know these things because when you're out ministering to people, when you're out talking to people, recognize and realize there are many people that don't know what you know. So they are ignorant of the word. And, you know, you, you run into people saying, oh, you only need the key to commandments. And, but the, back, the, the Bible says it's righteousness. So I want to get rid of something that's righteous. Matter of fact, we already know that the commandments of God actually, it actually reflects the character of God. Jesus is love. The commandments are love. God is faithful. The commandments are faithful. God is, right, God is righteous. The commandments are righteous. And on and on. The God is holy. The commandments are holy. And on and on. We know that. There are so many people. And one thing I found when we were ministering, we were up in uh, Charleston this week, Charleston, Virginia. West Virginia, and we're talking to this, this group of people. Where they're dogging the commandments, but didn't know where the commandments were. <laughs> That's amazing, man. You, you're dogging it. 
So where are the Ten Commandments? You, did you know the Ten Commandments are actually in the Bible? Where is it? Well, show it to me. <laughs> now, how can you be dogging the commandments? You don't even know where it's at. And, but I believe there were sincere people. That's why we had it. And I told them, I said, you know, they're part of this, this world denomination church. I don't know the name of it. I forget the name of it. But, and they seem like sincere people, but they're following a leader. And I said, you all have to study the Bible for yourself. In these last days, we've got to study the Bible for ourselves. Deuteronomy 6, 25, and it shall be our righteousness if we shall ad- observe and do what? All these commandments before the Lord our God, for he hath commanded us. So it shall be our righteousness only if we do what? Observe it. But we've got to be in Christ in order to observe the commandments of God, in order to attain the righteousness. But we've got to be in Christ because Christ teaches us how to go from unrighteousness to righteousness but we got to continue to do all these commandments amen and what are we judged by here's the bible here james 2 11 and 12 for he have said do not commit adultery where you find that by the way it's in the commandments 10 commandments so we know what we're talking about right the 10 commandments for he has said do not commit adultery also do not kill now if thou commit adult no adultery yet if thou kill, are you still guilty of breaking the law? Yes. Thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do. Not only talk about it, speak about it, teach about it, but be about it, and they shall be what? Judged by the law of liberty. It's right there, everybody. And never forget, I know people tell, say, well, it, it's bondage. Does that bondage? It sets you free. Now, now, no, again, so the wall around the sanctuary, righteousness. The commandments are righteousness. So the wall, righteousness and the commandments are synonymous. Did you get it? Did you miss it? And remember, Jesus, a reflector of his law, he is righteousness. But I want you to notice again, what you see here clearly when you look at the wall, you're looking at righteousness. When you look at the wall, you're looking at the standard. And the standard is what? The Ten Commandments. Because remember, the Ten Commandments is teaching us how to be righteous. This is the standard of righteousness. But in order to reach that standard of righteousness, i got to be abiding in who? Christ. Every day and totally be cut off from the world. Yeah going to see something here. So what is the purpose of a wall, by the way? What is the purpose of a wall? What is the purpose of walls? Did we say defense? That's good. Defense. Separation is a mark of territory. But the key thing I want you to notice is a mark of what? Separation. There's a reason why God had a wall in the sanctuary. Not only a symbolic understanding of the standard so when people are looking when all the children of israel are looking at this sanctuary they already know there is a marked distinction between what's out here and what's in there <laughs> did you get it there's a marked distinction you know in there is for you have to be righteous you have to be holy and that's the purpose of going in there is only how many gates one gate into it but we know the the walls are for separation the walls uh, that's the key word I want you to, to, to keep in mind. Separation is a wall of separation. It's a wall that clearly reveals the profane and the holy. What was outside was unrighteousness. What's inside is what? Righteousness. What's outside is corruption. What's inside is not corrupt at all. It's holiness. Do you see? So is there, there's a clear marked distinction. What's inside and what's outside? Do you think by what you've heard even thus far, do you think we need to build walls or tear them down? I want you to just think some more. Should we be building walls or tearing them down? So there is a, a marked distinction of loss saved. And only those what was, was, by the way, when Moses built the ark, what was the purpose of it? It was a sanctuary. Did you know that? That's what the ark was. It was a sanctuary. 
and those that was inside the sanctuary, they were saved. But those who are outside the sanctuary, they were what? Lost. How many gates were into, how many entryways was into the, to the boat? Yeah, I'm talking about the boat. <laughs> I'm talking about Noah's boat. <laughs> the big boat. I'm talking, yeah, I, yeah. But I'm talking about the ark. I'm actually the, the ark. How, how, many, how, many, how many people were in that who were saved? Eight. But they were where? Inside. See, that ark was like a, a sanctuary. Remember, a sanctuary, a place of safety. How many, how many doors was into that ark? One door. It was one way. How many, how many doors here? One. One way in. Only one way in. But there's a marked distinction. Understand that. between. So there is a wall of separation. There is a wall that God wants his children to to actually be within. But the key thing is, what did Noah do? What was his, one of his jobs? He built it, and what he built the, the ark. And what did he do? He did what? He invite others into the ark. They had to go through the, that one gate. Same thing here. What did the people have to do in order to actually become righteous? The Lord was teaching them a lesson. They had to go through the door and what do you have to do you invite him bring you want to be forgiven you got to go through the gate that one gate bible says jesus says i am the way the truth and the life no man comes to the father but by me so we can only be saved through christ and what are we to do today what are we to do invite people into the gate invite them into the walls that separate the holy from the profane you don't see something today you don't see why God wants us to have a wall of separation. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, 6 verse 2. I'm bringing this up because there's a lot of people talking about unification. But remember again, never forget what unifies us. What unifies us? Truth. Never forget that. So if the Bible says, if you two, if two not agree what do they need to do that's right can two walk together unless they agree can they no they can't so if i have an opposing view but i'm still going to try to walk together you're going to have some problems you, <laughs> amen you're going to compromise so but what unifies us is the law and the testimonies jesus christ the truth deuteronomy i'm just putting it just just keep that in your mind deuteronomy 6 2 that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and thy days may be prolonged. So we see here the commandments of God is a, is a protection, is a wall. Isn't it? He said if you keep them, you're going to be protected. What does John 15, 10, 11 said? We've seen this so many times. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. But you've got to be keeping his commandments. And it's revealing how, you can, how you're abiding in his love, keeping his commandments. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. See, God, does, do you think God actually need walls around Jerusalem? God didn't need no walls around Jerusalem. See, what made the wall around of Jerusalem different from the wall that's around the heathen nations? What was the difference? What was it? Knowing what you know already, already what we already studied, why, do you, why did they actually have a wall around Jerusalem? Was it really just for protection? Because remember, again, there's a wall in heaven. So is it really just for protection from the enemy? There is no enemy in heaven. So why did Israel have a wall? Just think. What was God teaching them? What was God teaching them about the wall or the, around the sanctuary? What is God teaching the people of Israel? And which, what does Israel mean, by the way? I'm just repeating this over and over again. What does Israel mean? God prevails. All right, so we keep God prevails. Remember, E L at the end of a of a of a name is God, and it, at Ezreal or Ezreal is prevails, or God rules. 
He is our ruler. So God is a ruler over Israel. He don't need no wall, but he has a wall. Now notice, for the heathen lands, heathen nations, they put up walls for straight-up protection. From the enemy. We know about Babylon when they put their, their walls up. They, they, were, they thought they were so secure with their wall. They said, ain't nobody taking down our wall. Even Belshazzar, remember the party he had? He knew Cyrus is out there, but he was partying so hard. He said, ain't nobody going to come in here. These walls are, 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 will keep us safe. See, they had a false security in a physical wall. But we, as God's people, we are not to get any security in a physical wall. But that physical wall for Israel was there to remind them of what? The boundary. To remind them that we are not to to unite with heathen nations. Didn't God say don't make any contract with a heathen nation? We're not to unite. In, In other words, there is a wall of separation, not just for protection is to reveal clearly that these are God's holy people and we are to invite people into the truth. These walls here represent the commandments of God, the standard of righteousness, the, the, the difference between the holy and the profane, the corrupt and the uncorrupt. Are y'all catching it now? So Why? Why were the literal walls of Jerusalem destroyed by Babylon and centuries later by the Roman Empire? Why? Were they actually destroyed? So understand this. Because the reason why, because of disobedience. They now, instead of the holy being the holy, they allow the profane to come in within the walls. Because remember, it really, God didn't need no wall. It's symbolic. And he was telling his people, don't get comfort. And because you got a wall up there, that wall means nothing. That wall will come tumbling down if you're disobedient. And we saw mainly they, the walls came tumbling down because they disobeyed God's commandments and they rejected the testimonies. They rejected the testimony. Were, were, were the people of Israel excited about the Messiah when he came as a little baby? They weren't even ready. They weren't even looking. They were so consumed in the things of this world. Deuteronomy 8, 19 and 20. And it shall be if thou do at all forget Lord, the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day. What's it say? That ye shall still be okay. You'll be all right. Don't worry about it. Keep on going. I'm blessing you anyway, anyhow. It said you shall surely perish. Do you know what perish means? Die. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before you before your face, ye shall perish because ye have not Ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Is obedience a big deal to the Lord? Yes. See, once we go outside the will of God, the walls have been going to be torn down. Did it happen? Did it happen? To, did it happen to Israel? Let's look at Isaiah 5, 3 and 5. Just go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Isaiah 5, 3 and 5. We're just going to see here. Just letting the Bible just walk us through this. So you can see, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get caught up into the fuzzies. That, oh, we all need to unite. We need to tear down the walls. <laughs> I, I, don't get caught up into the emotional fuzzies of that. When you not, you're not walking into an agreement, you're not walking according to what the word of God says. You have to make compromise in order to walk. Look at it. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more than my vineyard? He's talking about the children of Israel who've been disobedient to God. That I have not done with it, done in it. Wherefore, when I look that it should bring forth grapes, some luscious, beautiful grapes, 
it brought forth wild grapes. Verse 5, and now go to it. I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. What's the hedge, everybody? That's what goes around the vineyard. We talked about that in one of our uh, uh, parables. And it shall be eaten up and break down the what? Wall thereof. And it shall be trodden down. Why did the children of Israel walls come down? Because disobedience. And you'll notice something as we study because not only just disobedience, but what did they do? They remember they brought within the walls, they began to join with the world. They began to unite with the world. I want you to notice that. So now when they're doing these things, the walls came down. Was it fulfilled? Oh, Y'all remember the story? Y'all remember Jeremiah the prophet? Y'all remember? I, man, they were pleading. God was pleading to Israel through Isaiah. I mean, pleading like on his knees. Please, please turn around because you have now let the profane come in. Your walls are going to become what? Tumbling down. And the enemy's going to take over. I already told you this was going to happen. And you are doing it. And he pleaded, and he pleaded, and he pleaded. And then Jeremiah comes and pleads, and pleads, and pleads. And the people's like, no, I ain't doing it. Stiff neck. And we see it was fulfilled. Let's go to 2 Kings 25, 8, and 10. We know the story about Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. It's prophesied that he was actually going to come and take the land of Israel because of disobedience. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which is the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar then, captain of the guard and servant of the king of Babylon into Jerusalem. And he did what? Burnt the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the house of Jerusalem, and every man's house burnt he with fire, and all the army of Chaldees that were with the captain of the guard burnt, what did they do? Break down the walls of Jerusalem all around about it. They broke down the walls, burned it up, ransacked the city. Why? Because of obedience, they let the profane. There was supposed to be a wall of separation between the holy and the unholy. God fulfilled what he says is going to happen. But I want you to notice here. Who tore down these walls? Who tore down the walls? This, this fit, actually, who did it? Who did it? Who turned? Uh huh. Nebuchadnezzar and his army from the kingdom of what? The king. The king of what? Babylon. I want you to remember that now. That's a fit. That was an actual physical kingdom. Babylon tore down the walls because of the children of Israel's disobedience. It was Babylon. Don't miss it, everybody. <laughs> was that? <laughs> He's going somewhere, aren't we? <laughs> Zephaniah 3, 1, 2, and 6. Let's look at it. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted and to an oppressed city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. God was giving them correction. In other words, just like a child, the Lord was spanking them. Man, how frustrating it is it? Even after you spank them, they still are disobedient. That's what God was saying. After I spanked them, after I corrupt, cor- uh, corrected them, she trusted not in the Lord. Remember, the Lord said, I did all that I can do. She drew not near to her God. Verse 6, I have cut off the nations. Their towers are desolate. I made their streets waste, and none passes by. Their cities are destroyed. So are there no man, and there is none inhabited. The walls are gone. The city is torn down. Now, what's another reason why the walls of Jerusalem were destroyed by Babylon? What's another reason why? We know, in general, the disobedience. But don't you, what's that? Well, you know, disobedience of God's Ten Commandments. You say what? All right, I think you're right. They violated God's Sabbath day. We find that in Nehemiah 13. 
They begin to lightly esteem it first. That's how it starts. That's how it happens. In other words, they just, you know, go to, go to the, go to the uh, restaurant every now and then, lightly esteeming the Sabbath. And began to talk about the game on the Sabbath and other things, lightly esteeming the Sabbath because this is God's holy day. Then it moved from that to not even keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> Nehemiah 13, 7, and 18 in the last days is going to move from that to people receiving the mark of the beast. Nehemiah. Then I contended, this is Nehemiah talking, then I continued with the nobles of Jerusalem, Judah and said unto them, what evil thing is this that that do? And profane the Sabbath. What they were doing, they were profaning the Sabbath. And what was Nehemiah trying to do? What was he doing? What was Nehemiah's job? What was he doing? What was the, what was the purpose of Nehemiah being there? He was building the wall. Now you're building a wall, and he already know why the walls came tumbling down in the first place. He's trying to build a wall, and they're profaning the Sabbath. So what did he say? Verse 18, did not your fathers thus, and did not your, our God bring all this evil upon us and upon the city, yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath? This was one of the reasons why the walls were broken down. Not only being disciplined to other commandments, but also particularly here, you know it's the Sabbath. Jesus' prophecy during the time of Rome and empire, we know the prophecy, Matthew 24, 1 and 2, and Jesus went out and depart from the temple and his disciples and came unto him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Hey, look at you, look at all these buildings. Look at this, this is beautiful. And what did Jesus say? And Jesus said unto them, see ye not that all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be one left. There shall not be one stone left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Why? What did they do to Jesus later on? They crucified him. They rejected the righteous God, crucified him, rejected the testimonies of Jesus. And what happened as a result? Did it happen? 70 AD, you all should know that. Rome came, led by Titus, and ransacked the city. We know this story. It was a horror. That's a matter of fact, that's how Israel was spread out all over the world. And many were killed and crucified, um, believe it or not. Now, spiritually, oh, y'all can answer this question. <laughs> because notice again, in the literal sense, who destroyed the, the walls of Israel? Who, was a, who, who destroyed the law, laws of Israel in a literal sense? Who, who are, two, who are two, two people that you know? Two, two, Babylon, two empires. In, in, uh, okay, Babylon, you're right. What's the other empire? Okay, y'all got it. It was what? Babylon and Rome. Is there a prophetic connection? Is there a prophetic, symbolic Babylon? Today, who does Babylon represent? We already, the, we already know who the mother of Babylon is, right? Papal Rome. All right, who are the daughters of Babylon, the false prophets, the apostate churches? And who are the, the dragon of Babylon? The pagan, the pagan, pagan religion and things like that. The pagan religion, the, the, the uh, Eastern philosophies. In other words, everything that don't fit the other category that's not following truth. Really, that's what it is. Because you got the mother of Babylon, you got apostate churches with all the evangelical churches that are apostate. And then you have basically everyone else, even Satanists and atheists and, and things like that. Spiritualism. So spiritually, who have destroyed the walls of truth according to Bible prophecy? Babylon. Who's the empire? Who is a literal empire? Who is a seventh kingdom that's raising up right now? Who's that seventh kingdom that's raising up right now? Is who? Now you got papal Rome. 
See, before you had Babylon, the literal Babylon, and you had the literal kingdom of Rome, but now you have the spiritual Babylon and the literal kingdom of papacy, the papacy itself. Now, in the days, what must God's remnant people do in the last days? Should we be tearing down walls or building it up? What did Nehemiah do in a time of reformation? Were they tearing down walls or building it up? The walls were, were torn down because of what? Disobedience. But just like in the ark, what did Noah do? He was building and inviting inside the ark. We are to do the same thing. We are to build, just like in Nehemiah's day, they should to build and invite people into the ark of safety. You are catching that, right? Because but who, are tearing, but who will tear down the walls? Babylon. Papal Rome. Now, why is Satan wroth with God's remnant in these last days? We already know the dragon was wroth. Uh, Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the women and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testament of Jesus. We know the commandments of God is the standard of righteousness. So these are the people that continue to keep up the wall, keep building the wall. Look at Isaiah 58, 2 through 13. Because there's a major breach in the wall today. And what is that breach? And they shall be of thee, shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath the delight and holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thy own ways, nor finding own pleasures, nor speaking thy own words. In the last days we are to build, to repair the breach. In the breach, one of the major gaps in our wall is the Sabbath. Because a Sabbath separates the holy from the profane. Remember again, the Sabbath is a holy day. But when I bring the profane in a holy day, I'm breaking down the walls. And that's why it is an offense to God. When people actually hold on to that counterfeit Sabbath, because that is profane, it is not the truth. And it tears down the wall. In these last days, what do you think our main thing should be all about? We have to be building the walls and inviting the people in to the walls. Remember, we all know the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah cut bear in the kingdom of Persia. Where Artaxerxes, he's a king. And Nehemiah was a faithful man, a faithful Hebrew, a faithful Israelite. But he worked for the king. And, but he got word that. Those walls, they remember, they were actually released from Babylon. Those who wanted to go back to Jerusalem, they were given permission to build the, the temple, and they did that. But then they, later on, we know, they were given permission to, and, and what happened in uh, 457 B.C.? Right, they were the command that was given that they could actually start their government. But the things, where they were going, they were moving along, but they still had some problems. And the word comes back to Nehemiah, said, man, the walls are still burned down. You know what happened way years and years ago when Babylon, they still, it still crumbled, man. It's, you know, it all, you know, temple's gone up, but, you know, we still got some problems. We still, it's, I'm telling you, it looks bad, bro. Because he, Nehemiah understood the walls are not just, it's not just for literal protection. It's to represent what it all, re what, what, what it all represented. It represented that we are in the righteousness of God. It, it represents that we are now in obedience to God. It was symbolic. So he's like, wait a minute. We got to get the walls back up. So he goes back and he looks around the place. We know the story. And he gives a plan of rebuilding the wall. We, we know about the opposition. They tried everything to stop him. I call them the three frogs. <laughs> the, three, <laughs> the three false prophets. I think it was Sambalat, Tobiah, and the one that started with a G, Geshem, or something like that. But anyway, they tried to stop them. But did they stop them? They moved forward. Even when they had to put swords in their hands and have, a, uh, and have they had soldiers there watching over. And, and anyway, bottom line is they built that wall, and actually it seemed like record time. The wall was built. 
and he used, where did he get his resources from? Did, did, did uh, Nehemiah have the money to do it? Does this stuff cost money? Yes, it does. This stuff costs money. But he was given the resources from who? The king of Persia. And his job was to use that to build back the wall. And the whole purpose of Israel is to invite the people into the wall to learn about God. And Jesus, when Jesus came, what did he come to do? To restore the wall, to build the wall of truth, the commandments of God in particular, because God says, I came not to destroy the law nor the prophets. I didn't come to destroy the law nor the testimonies. I came to fulfill them. I came to give you more understanding of it. I came to make it very clear, and he did that. I came to establish the law, not get rid of it. He magnified the law. Amen. That's right. He magnified the law. Notice what it says here in Christ's object lesson. Christ's coming was at a time of intense worldliness. Men were sur- sub- subordinating the internal to the temporal. The claims of the future, the claims of the future to the affairs of the present. Listen to this. They were mistaking phantoms. You know what phantoms are, right? Something that don't exist. They were <laughs> mistaking fake news. They were, ex- they were mistaking phantoms for reality. They were <laughs> mistaking fake news for reality. I don't want to say Trump, but <laughs> I know, ain't that something? They call, and, they, and that's what it says here. And realities for phantoms. So in other words, they take realities, what's happening, and say that's fake. But they take what's fake and say that's real. That's what happened then, and it was happening today. They did not, by faith, behold the unseen world. Satan presented them the, the things of his life as all attractive, all absorbing, and they gave heed to his temptations. Jesus came at the height when, when, when the Roman uh, games were extremely popular. Did you know that? People don't think, see, what they had back then is the same thing we had today. Only thing that's different between then and now, we got electricity and they didn't. That's really it. They had just as much entertainment as we do today. Now, we can just push a button and just watch on TV. We don't have to go to the Coliseum. They all went to the Coliseum. They had a lot of reverie. They had a lot of games. You read, you look at, if you ever studied Roman uh, entertainment, it was a whole lot. They had theaters. And it's all throughout the empire. They made sure they had an entertainment coliseum all throughout the empire where people are absorbed. And because you have Christians there, Christians are there, and they began to break down that wall of separation and began to step outside and then mix the holy. And then at the same time, be, and be bold about it and bring the profane inside. But what's going to happen to the walls? They're going to be torn down. So Christ came in an intense worldliness. Christ came to change the order of things. He came to build the walls back up. He sought to break the spell which men were infatuated and snared. In, in his teaching, he sought to adjust the claims of heaven and earth, to turn men's thoughts from the present to the future, for, from their pursuit of the things of time. He called them to make provision for eternity. He came when the walls were torn down, broke. Rebel, rubble all over the place. But God, Jesus Christ himself, came to rebuild that. In the last days, the same is true. We are living in intense times, and the walls have been breached. And God has called us to rebuild the wall. Now, notice something. You see that picture there. What do you guys start doing? You got to move it out the way. Now, 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 back in Nehemiah's day, they didn't have bulldozers and all that equipment. See, God says you got a personal work to do. In other words, you got to get your hands down in there, pick them bricks up, and then we all got to build this thing hand by hand, brick by brick. Is that going to be work? Are you going to be sweating? And we are to use the resources that God has given us to rebuild the wall, invite people into the wall. The question is today, as we begin to, to, to move into the last part of this, 
Are you a repairer of the breach, building the walls of truth in these last days? Are you, are you building it or tearing it down? Now, how do you know you're tearing it down? You should know. How do you know is you're tearing down God's wall of truth? Disobedience. Bringing the holy with the, pro, bringing the, the profane and bringing it to the holy. Now, let me ask you a question. You're asked, have, have you asked God into the presence of your home? And if I've asked God into the presence of my walls, now we have our physical walls here to, to keep us from the elements, to like, also to keep thieves out of here. You know, we, we, that's why we have the physical walls. We all lock our doors or whatever. But the reality is, <laughs> let's be real, that don't mean nothing to a lot of thieves anyway. They just kick that door in. <laughs> I'll see if it, they kick it in. Matter of fact, they, they learn, I've learned, cause the, um, they don't care about alarm systems. They really don't care about cameras either. That's actually a false security. Everybody said, I got cameras everywhere. What they do is they, they cover it or they cut off the electricity and kick in the door. Now, one thing that I did learn, because they actually interviewed thieves in prison and said, what is the most deterrent for you? What's the greatest deterrent? There's, two main, there's one main thing. Guess what it was? A dog. <laughs> they said, when they start hearing dogs bark, they have second thoughts. Another thing is, when they hear like something on, like a radio or a TV, because then they're thinking somebody's in the house. But that's just a tip. <laughs> so the alarms, they said, they don't mean nothing. The other stuff don't mean nothing. But when they hear something that's in the house, they said, maybe somebody's there, and I don't want to confront. But some thieves are bold enough to do it anyway. But a dog, most definitely. But the question is, think about it. If you ask the Lord into your house, just like you ask the Lord into your heart, when I ask the Lord into my heart, I am now covered up with righteousness. It's, it's as if I have this wall of separation between the holy and the profane. Now, I'm trying to make it practical and personal. So now that I know that, but if I'm watching things that are not holy or listen to things that are ho- not holy, what am I doing to the wall? Breaking it down. You understanding that? Same thing into my, even my physical house. When I know that I, these, this, this house, because we have the presence of the Lord here, because Jesus Christ is here, but I, but I, I go to the red box. I pick up the rated R movie, whatever it is, and I bring it into the house. What have I done? I've me- I'm mixing now the profane with the holy. I'm trying to make it practical. And then when I do that, I am actually tearing down the wall. And you see what God reveals. He is literally going to plead with you. I'm still pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. Get that stuff out of here. It don't belong in here. Do you think, what was, what, why was, uh, Nadab and Abihu, why were they destroyed? They mixed the holy with the profane. And God revealed in that sanctuary, it was holy. They were destroyed because of that. Are you inviting others to come in within the walls of salvation through Jesus Christ? Are you building the wall, inviting people into the wall to be saved? Again, we can't get caught into all the fuzzy emotionalism. Oh, you need to come out here and join us. Join us. Let's unify together and join us. Okay, and I mix the holy with the profane. Have you taken into account the resources and talents that God gives you for the work of building and inviting? See, this kind of puts everything together that we already talked about, and now we, we've talked about walls, and now we're talking about the mammon of unrighteousness. Did you know that God wants us to take into account for all that he has given us? Why does Jesus give us resources and treasures? And we've learned this from the unjust steward, right? We studied this before, so I'm not going to go all the details of everything of it. I'm mainly going to be looking at the last part, but let's look at the story again just for a reminder as we begin to wrap things up here. And he said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was a same was a cost unto him that he wasted his goods. The word came, the steward wasted his goods. And he called him in and said unto him, Whose goods was it anyway? 
It was a certain man, the rich man's goods. He gave it to his accountant, and the accountant, who was supposed to be taking care of the money, wasted it. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear of this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship. Count up the money, man. All the money he's supposed to have, count it up. Where's the money? He's like, man, I don't got the money because I spent the money. <laughs> For thou hast made no longer be steward. He's like, oh. In other words, you're fired. We looked at this before. You're fired if you don't give an account. And the man already knew he couldn't give an account because he already wasted it. Then the steward said within himself, okay, I wasted the money. What shall I do now? What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I can't dig. I can't do nothing else. I ain't dope digging no ditches. And I'm too ashamed to beg. To beg, to beg I am ashamed. Said, I'm too ashamed to beg. I'm resolved what to do. That when I put, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of plan. When I'm put out of the stewardship, they shall receive me into their houses. So he called every one his lords and debtors to him and said unto the first, How much thou owest my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. He said unto them, Take the bill and sit down quickly, write fifty. Then he said to another, How much thou owest? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. And the Lord commended the just, unjust steward because he has done wisely. Notice this now. For the children of this world are in this generation wiser than the children of light. Hey, Lord, why would you say that? You're saying the children of light are, are not as wise as it. And he's talking about in that gener, in that, uh, children of this world are at that ge, of that generation were wiser than the children of light. Then he said, continue on, and I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. Now, I ain't going to lie, that last text has tripped me all over the place. I was like, Lord, you make you friends of, make yourselves friends of mammon, of unrighteousness. I thought you are not supposed to have the holy with the profane. I mean, the holy with the profane. I thought you mix mixing with the unrighteousness. <laughs> we'll learn what that is in a second. Now, what key did we learn about the unjust steward previously? So I'm not going to go over it again. The, but the first part of the unjust steward, what, what was a key lesson there? What did, did the unjust steward do? He lowered the standard. Remember that? He lowered the standard in order to be what? Accepted. <laughs> he lowered the standard in order to be accepted, and that's what people are doing today. Lowering the standard to be accepted. So whenever you lower God's standard and break the law of God in order to be accepted by others, you are, build, are you building up or tearing down the wall of truth? And we know you're tearing it down. Now, now, now let me ask a question. If you want to call people out of Babylon... Do you join Babylon, drink their Babylonian wine to save Babylon? (laughs) So why are people trying to do that? I'm being practical. How can I call people out of Babylon and I'm joining with Babylon, unifying with Babylon, having prayer visuals with Babylon, and then say, okay, y'all come inside the wall of, of truth? No, it don't work that way. I can't drink the wine of Babylon and be sober with truth. What rebuke was Jesus giving the professed people of God and the Jewish leaders at the time in Luke 16, 8? Look at it again. It was actually a rebuke. This was a rebuke to the children of light. And the Lord commended unjust steward because ye have done wisely for the children of this world in their generations, wiser than the children of light. Why were they wiser than the children of light? At least they said, hey, you were, you, <laughs> this is what the world does. You planned it, you executed it, and you did it well. Because you want to be accepted by the world. And that's what you do. You, you lowered the standard. You did that well according to the worldly standard. But the children of light, you do nothing. That's what he said. You are doing nothing. Remember, you're children of the light. What do you have? You have the truth, the whole truth, the whole law and the testimonies to share to the world, the three angels message. You got it and you're doing nothing. You got the people of the world executing evil things. And doing it well. They will spend literally 15, 20 million dollars on a movie to make it. I ain't talking about from it. To make a movie. They will invest to make this movie and all the stuff that go with it. 
hoping they make a profit. But we are like, oh, we got the truth. I don't know. Uh, we need to save our billion dollars for retirement. You know, when all the ministers get old. God is saying, you have, you are, you're not execute. Look what the world is doing. They're executing plans. And you're just talking about, well, you know, let's do a little seminar for ourselves. That was a rebuke to the people of Israel. The reveal that what they were doing, they were not using what God had gave them. He was telling the people of Israel, you have been foolish. What did the Lord call the unjust steward? Wiser than children of light. I just talked about that. Now, in the last part of the parable, Jesus gets very personal. And describes why he gives us the resources and the money as a children of the light. See, he's breaking it down. He's saying, y'all ain't doing it, but I'm going to tell you what you should be doing and how it should be used as you build up the wall and invite the people in. Luke 16, 9, again, let's look at it. Because I had to read this over and over and over and over and over again, but I think I got it. <laughs> and I think you'll get it too. And it said, And I say unto you, make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. I'm going to stop right there. Because when you look at the text, you're like, oh, man, you're saying make your friend. In our English, we say of is a preposition. You're saying it's part of that, you know, we're going to make friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. And that did not make sense to me. Because I'm putting that, remember, when you're still in Bible study, you've got to put the whole Bible together to come with, the, with, the, the, with truth. And I'm like, Lord, that just don't make sense to me. I'm, 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 I'm not trying to be funny, Lord. But you're trying to tell me to make friends of mammon of unrighteousness? I mean, in other words, you're trying to make me say make friends of unrighteousness. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't catching it at first. He said, okay, all right, go to the original Greek of of. And then look at, even in the spirit of prophecy, sometimes Ellen White uses the revised version of the Bible. And it actually gives you even a better translation than what we have here. You look at the word of in the Greek, in this particular context, it actually means from. Did y'all get it? <laughs> it actually means from. So it would re -re re read, and I say unto you, make yourselves friends from mammon of unrighteousness. We know what mammon is. Mammon means treasure. Let me ask you a question. Can a treasure make you righteous? A treasure is an inanimate object. I think I got some money today. Can this make you righteous? Can I buy righteousness with this? No. This is mammon of unrighteousness. Can't make you righteous. It's not righteous. It's mammon. And God says, now, can I go, can I say, give you a dollar, say, you want to be, uh, you want to you give your life to Jesus Christ? You take this dollar, become a, you, no, because God has explained, even you giving somebody money, don't make you, them righteous. But you've got to use the money of unrighteousness to win friends for Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is our friend. Because look at the text. And I say unto you, make yourselves friends with. And it actually in the Revised Standard Version, it, actually, it says, make yourselves, make yourselves friends by the means of the mammon of unrighteousness. So in other words, does that camera cost money? Now, am I using that camera to do hip-hop videos. No. So I had to, I bought the camera, took money, right? So this is mammon of righteousness. I went and it bought it online in exchange for a camera to actually spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what we're saying, that God is revealing, I use the mammon of unrighteousness. YouTube was not designed it wasn't designed. The, 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 the person that found it said, hey, we want to make YouTube to spread the gospel of the three angels' message. It's mammon of unrighteousness. But we saw it as a tool to say, hey, we can use that and get the gospel out. It costs to do it, but we can take the resources that God gives us to give the gospel, to win people in, to build up the wall and invite people into the ark of safety, to invite them into the sanctuary of truth. And God revealing that, he said it, and he continued on, and that when ye, talking about, it's actually talking about the mammon, fail, when the mammon fails, ye shall be received into everlasting habitations. When you do this work, 
Not only will you see the people that you won to Christ, but you will be received into the habitations, everlasting habitations, because you brought them to the sanctuary of truth. And you use your funds. And this is what reveals to me. And I said, Lord, thank you. That just shows again that we, are, we don't have indispensable funds. In other words, I can't just say, well, Lord, this, you know, I gave you my money. Now I'm going to go plot the plan. I'm going to go to, to, the, to the Panther Stadium and, 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 pay, and pay the ticket and, and go watch the Panthers play because, you know, this is my money. I said, no, no. That's the... the are you winning people for Christ for that? How in that whole scheme of things or what you're doing, are you putting money into the outside the gate or inside the gate? Outside the walls or inside the walls? Do you understand? So that's the reason why. Just, that's the reason why we, God is saying to his people in these last days, and I've talked to you about this before, and you can look it up yourself. See, all these denominations, they, some of them got a lot of money. I'm talking about a lot. And the Adventist church in particular has a lot of money. When you have 19 million people, just do the math. This is a lot of money. It's billions. And they put it in the stock market. Do you think God approves of that? See, if you're putting into a stock market, the stock market is gambling, really, because you can actually, it's a risk. There's a risk. So I'm putting it into the stock market. That is not bringing people into the gospel. And they were doing some of the same things back then. Now, understand this. Is money evil? Money's not evil. We're not evil. Is mammon of unrighteousness? Is this evil? Can this go around and hurt you and kill you? No, it's how you use it. Because the Bible says, for the love of the money is the root of all evil. The love of it. The covetousness of it. And using it in the wrong way. To the unfaithful steward, his Lord's goods have been entrusted for benevolent, benevolent purposes, for he had used them for himself. So with Israel, God has chosen the seed of Abraham. With a high arm, he had delivered them from bondage of Egypt. In Egypt, he had made them the depositaries of sacred truth for the blessing of the world. He had entrusted to them the living oracles that they might communicate the light to others. But his steward had used these gifts to enrich and exalt themselves. Why do you think Trump is president? You think he really cares for you? When the character's already revealed himself, I'm not trying to be political here, but I'm just saying the character already revealed to him is about everybody. It's about him. How can somebody not show the tax records? When the reality is it will show that all he has a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that he shouldn't have his hand in and he'll benefit as a president. God's people, we are to ra- do the thing. We have the money to, to enrich myself. Should I get a big old, oh, I got the money. Now let me get a Cadillac. What is the main lesson that Jesus is teaching in the parable of the unjust steward? What's the main lesson? Let's look at this as we wrap it up. What's the main lesson? Jesus actually says it. He gave us a lesson right here in the text. Luke 16, 1 through 13. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust in, as in much. So if I'm unfaithful, I keep using this dollar to go get my little Netflix rental for the day. He says you're going to be unfaithful for the big stuff. If you can't spend a dollar right, you sure enough can't spend $100,000 right. And he's telling that to his people. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, having been faithful in using this mammon to do the work of God, will I commit your trust to thee to the true riches? <laughs> this riches of the third angel's message. Remember what God told Ephesus. You have fallen from your love. If you have not repented, what did he, what's he going to do? He said, I will remove your candlestick. If you are not faithful, God is revealing him to all of us personally, not just as a church, but even personally. And the means used to bless others will bring returns. That's what God's revealing here. Continue on verse 12. And if thou have not been faithful in which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? That's what happened to the, the steward. That wasn't the steward's money. It was the rich man's money. So if you haven't been faithful with somebody else's money, how are you going to be faithful with your own money that God gives you? No servant can move, serve two masters. 
For either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to unto one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So he's not saying this, that we're to serve this. We're to use this for the work. But if I become covetous, oh, I got to have it. I got to have it for my retirement so I can stay on the beaches and this and that. Then he's saying you're serving the mammon. But you use the unrighteous mammon to spread the gospel in these last days. And the means used to bless others will bring returns. Riches rightly employed will accomplish great good. Souls will be won to Christ. He who follows Christ's plan of life will see in the course of God those whom he has labored and sanctif- sacrificed on earth. Grateful, gratefully will be the ransom ones remembered. Remember those who have been instrumental in their salvation. Isn't that awesome? I just, the Lord just wants us to think what the mean, what the end is all about. Pressures will be heaven. Pressures will heaven be to those who have been faithful in the work of saving souls. Faithful in building and inviting. The lesson of this parable is for who, everybody? All. Everyone will be held responsible for the grace given him through Christ. Life is too seldom to be absorbed in the temporal and earthly matters. The Lord desires that we should communicate to others that which the eternal, which the eternal and the unseen communicates to us. Amen. Is it time to tear down the walls or build them up? And I know, you know, we know it happened in 1989. It was history when the communist walls came tumbling down. The wall that separated East Berlin to West Berlin in which the communist country of Russia was on one side and you had the free, uh, free allies, the Americans, the, the French, and England on the other side who owned the other side of West Berlin. And we know West Berlin came as a result of World War II after the allies won. But Russia was a communist country and they didn't want the people to be free. And they eventually built a wall. And then eventually it came crumbling down. That's the history. And, the, and the, that was a symbol of communism. And, and that, once that symbol went down, we know that was actually prophetically fulfilled. Communism was dissolved. And it was, the wall came down. So that's, that's a little history of what I'm going to mention here. Tear down this wall. That's what <laughs> Reagan said years before the Berlin Wall was taken down. He went to Berlin and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And today, we got the evangelical movement saying, using that same spin. I want y'all to see this now. Using that same spin and saying, tear down this wall. Ecumenical week focused on overcoming division. When a group of German Christians was asked in 2014 to prepare materials for the 2017 week of prayer, week of prayer for Christian unity, their choice of a wall as a symbol of what everybody? Sin, evil, and division explicitly referred to the Berlin Wall. Now, and for some, they'll say, oh, wow, that's, that sounds good. That's on the surface, everybody, because when we already understood what the wall symbolically represents, should I be tearing down a wall? Does the wall represent sin? Does it represent? It represents the vision of truth and error, <laughs> holy and a profane. I'm not saying put up a Berlin Wall, but we're to put up the wall of truth. But they're saying, oh, we need to tear down walls. The German reflection of the power of prayer to bring down the walls. Again, they're saying the ecumenical movement, which is led by Papal Rome, is telling all Christians you need to join together regardless of your differences. We just join on the things that we agree to. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that truth joins us together. I don't have to try to join somebody. If we're all following the truth, then we're joined together. But they're promoting Christian unity. The World Council of Churches, Faith and Order Commission, the Vatican's Pontifical Council for the Promoting Christian Unity. Now, who, by the way, who's the beast? We already know. Papal Rome. Who's pushing this whole thing? Papal Rome. Is there something wrong with tearing down a wall? Yes. The wall separating. <laughs> the wall separating Christians seems to be equally immovable. 
and entrenched. And that's what they're saying. A way to show our hope and faith will bring this church in unity. Tear down your walls. Let's, let's just only agree. And why is a church? And we studied, we looked at this before. You got, we're going to Babylon. We're joining with them. Are we building the wall or tearing it down? That's tearing down the walls. That's exactly what Papal Rome wants us to do. Remember again, who's tearing it down now? Babylon. And if I'm joining with Babylon, I'm tearing down my walls. If I'm joining with Papal Rome, I'm doing what? Tearing down the walls. Let's end off with this. Revelation 21, 7 to 19. I just heard, uh, <laughs> I didn't put it up here, but that's what we're doing. They're inviting Babylonian ministers to a, the children of light. They're supposed to know the light to the churches, to the pulpit. Now, is that building a wall or tearing it down? That's tearing down a wall. Bring it in Babylon and tear down a wall. But it sounds so good. Let's unify, right? Let's unify together. It sounds so, man, you come to my church and preach, and then I go to your church and preach. That sounds so emotionally sentimental. But God says, no. Don't bring the profane in here preaching Babylonian messages. But now we've gone out there taking Babylonian messages and bringing it to the pulpit. It's bringing down a wall. Revelation 21, 17 and 19. I think y'all got that point. Y'all got it? Amen. Revelation 21, 17 and 19. We're going to end with this. Because I mentioned earlier that God has a wall in heaven. And now, and, and this wall is it's a actual, physical, literal wall. But God doesn't need walls, but it's there as a symbol for us for eternity. And he measured the wall thereof. It was 130, 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is an angel. And the building of the wall that was of jasper. Anybody seen jasper before? The wall is built of jasper. The city was pure gold like the clear gas. The foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of special, precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, uh, chalcedony. And the fourth, an emerald. And so on. God has walls. And he will have a wall in heaven, so it's not time to tear down walls. This wall is symbolic of what, everybody? I should know it by now. Of what? Righteousness. The commandments. is truth forever and ever and ever and ever. Not needed for protection. But notice this walls have how many gates? Twelve gates into the city. Because those inside it are part of God's disciples. Those who follow. Those who are righteous now already in Christ. Because there we are living with who? Jesus Christ. We are living with him. We are with him. We are together forever throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity in a real literal city with walls. It's not time to tear down any walls. It's time to build them up and use God's unrighteous mammon to do that and invite others into the ark of safety, the ark of truth, the sanctuary of truth. Did you get it or did you miss it? You got it, amen? Amen.